Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may happen to be on God's glorious earth. Welcome to Balance Point. We pray that you have had a wonderful, wonderful week in the presence of the Almighty God and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh my, what a wonderful day to be alive. What a wonderful time to be alive. Because there is no God like our God. There is no saving grace like our God's grace. Oh my goodness gracious. How wonderful our God is. We pray that today will be a blessing to you. As we conclude our study, Hopefully we will conclude our study in Luke chapter 6. We are now up to part 5, or well, technically part 6, because part 4 had two parts. And we are coming into a period of this chapter where Jesus begins to tell some parables. So, turn with me in your Bible to the 6th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be beginning at verse 39. That's verse 39 of Luke chapter 6. And the title of today's message is GPS, God's Positioning System. And this is really a continuation of our previous few lessons, which you can find on our YouTube channel. You can also find those lessons at our ministry center at balancepointla.org. And all of these kind really do go together. But before we dig in, let us settle our hearts with a word of prayer. Father God, we welcome you. And that seems so funny to say that we welcome you because you are already here. But we praise you and we give you honor and we give you glory. For you are God, you are creator, you are lawgiver, you are savior, you are father, you are friend. And we know, God, that in your presence there is a fullness of joy. And so, Father God, we invite your presence to fill us with joy. And we thank you, Father God, for your word. We thank you, Father God, for our breath. We thank you, Father God, that we can worship you. And Father God, some of us worship you freely. Doors open, outside, inside. But Father God, we remember our brothers and sisters throughout the world who may not have the ability to worship you freely, but rather, Father God, must worship you in hiding. And so, Father God, we do stand with our brothers and sisters, and we ask, O oh God, for your grace and your mercy and your comfort to them. Thank you, Father God, for this time in your word, in the name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. So here we go, part five of Luke chapter six. And I have to be honest because at this point in the chapter, it seems like Jesus takes a left turn, or in your case, a left turn, <laughs> away from where he's been talking. Let's consider, let, let's just kind of briefly recap chapter 6. You know, chapter 6 starts off with some controversies. You know, Jesus and his disciples walking through the field and you know, they pick some grain and they're eating some grain as they're walking through the grain fields. It happened to be a Sabbath. And that did not fit with the 
ideas, the, the traditions of how the Sabbath was meant to be. And so, of course, there was a controversy. And then we see Jesus in the synagogue, and there's a man with a withered hand, and Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And again, according to the traditions, that was considered work. And so, again, controversy. Controversy. And then in the same chapter, after these two controversies, Jesus goes up on a mountain and he prays. And he's seeking God's will. And after a night in prayer, he comes down from the mountain and he selects out of the disciples that have been following him. And really, out of the crowds, the disciples, and out of the disciples, the twelve whom he would call apostles and he would send. And then he preaches to the crowd. Here in Luke we have a recording of a shortened version of the Beatitudes that we find in Matthew. And he, 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 he preaches blessings. He, he, he gives four blessings and four woes. And then he gets into the rules of kingdom life. You know, really summarizing the law and the prophets. Love your enemies as you love yourself. And he compares what a kingdom-minded person would be compared to an, a worldly-minded person. The kingdom-minded person loves all people. They love their enemies. They may not agree with them, but they love them. They love them. Whereas a worldly-minded person only loves those from whom they can get gain, whether that gain is material or power or physical or emotional. And Jesus says, what good is it to you to love to those who can give back to you? Even the sinners do that. But he says, but be like your father in heaven and be merciful. And then he talks about judgment. And, and, he, and he speaks about how whatever we put out, whatever thoughts, whatever words, whatever actions we put out, they're going to come back at us. And so if we put out forgiveness, we will receive forgiveness. If we give away, we will receive back. If we love out, we will receive love back in. And I, in our last session, mentioned that this was the scariest verse in the Bible to me. Because it says that what we get is in our hands. Now, salvation is not in our hands. Salvation is given to us as a free gift based on the completed work that Jesus did in, in, on the cross. But everything else in life, what we receive in life is up to us. And technically, even salvation is up to us. Because we can choose not to accept what God has done for us. And so I said that verse 38 was the scariest verse in the Bible. Given it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be put into your bosom. It'll be put into your heart. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you. This is the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever you put out, you're going to get back. Now over here, behind me, you can see kind of some blackout curtains and some light. That's because we have a little micro farm here in the studio where I record these and where I stream. And on those shelves is a perfect example of that law of sowing and reaping. In each of those trays, I might put anywhere from 
10 grams in the case of like pea shoots you know it might be 200 grams of seed in the trays in the soil and I water it and I fertilize it and I give it light and after a couple of weeks I get a harvest and when I harvest I get seeds back no I don't get seeds back I get plants but they are the plant that is the fruit of that seed. Do I get the same 10 grams back that I put into the tray? No. For the most part, we're getting 100 times back what we put in. So where I may have put 10 grams of seeds in, I'm getting over 100 grams of crop out. And life is the same way. Whatever you give out, you're going to get it back. You're going to get it back after you give it back out. And you're going to give back more than you put out. And that's why I said that was the scariest verse in the Bible. And I asked this, what are we planting? And so today, we pick up in verse 39. We pick up in verse 39, and when we read verse 39 and 40, we're going to go, huh, that is a shift from where we've been. <clears throat> and yet it really continues the thought. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, these are th this whole sermon is organized a little differently. And we have to remember that Matthew as a tax collector, would have been a, a government official. And back then, they didn't have fax machines. They didn't have scanners. You couldn't send a PDF. And if you wanted to record something, you were going to write it down. Now, as a tax collector, he would have been trained in shorthand. He would have been trained in stenography, which means that when you read sermons and discourses in, in the Gospel of Matthew, you are more than likely reading the exact things that Jesus said as he said them. Because Matthew could take shorthand. Here in Luke, what we are getting is, Luke is a compilation of the accounts of various eyewitnesses and ear witnesses to the events. And since it's a compilation rather than a recording, Matthew is more of a recording, things are in different order. And so we have here in Luke leading straight into, watch this, and Jesus spoke a parable to them, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? That seems like a discordant change. And yet, it still flows. Because watch this. Can the blind lead the blind? We just got done talking about the difference between a kingdom person and a worldly person. And Jesus' point here is, who are you learning from? And, and, and you will see this. Watch this. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like their teacher. In other words, you're going to be like those that you listen to. A very wise man when I was in my 20s once told me, show me who you hang out with and what you read, and I will show you the person that you will be in 10 years. And that struck, that stuck with me. Let me repeat that. Show me the people that you hang out with now and the things that you're reading, 
and I will show you who you will be in 10 years. And that's, that is the summary of what Jesus is saying here. You see, the previous section, it talked about the difference between worldly and godly. And Jesus is saying, look, if you listen to the worldly thing, if you follow the worldly pattern, you will become a worldly person. You will become a person of the world. Can the blind lead the blind? That's the worldly way. But then Jesus follows on and says, a disciple is not above his teacher. In other words, you're going to be like those that you choose to learn from. And so my question for this week is, who are you learning from? Who are you following? What GPS system are you using? Are you using God's GPS? Are you following the godly positioning system? And following the example of Jesus. And by the way, if you're following me, don't follow me. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fall. I'm going to disappoint. Follow Jesus. Follow the word. Follow the example of God. Follow the example of God. And what, what is the example of God? Watch this. A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like the teacher. So what teacher do we want to follow? Well, let's jump back up to verse 35 and 36. Here's our teacher. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of of the Most High God. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High God. For he, who, who, the Most High God, is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful just as your father is also merciful. But everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Wow. So when we're perfectly trained, and by the way, that's what this life here on earth is about. This life here on earth is a training ground. We are in training, and we are training for one of two places. We are either training for heaven, where we will have life eternal in the presence of God, where there's fullness of joy and love and peace. And by the way, heaven ain't hanging out on clouds, playing the harp. Although as a guitarist, I could be down with that. Or we're training for hell. Where it's a life of bitterness, and it is an eternal life of bitterness, loneliness, rejection, regret. So let me ask you, what are you learning? Who are you learning from, and what are you learning? And what are you training for? Because remember, everyone who's perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Who's teaching you? Are you being taught by the God that created you, who loves you, who cares for you? Or are you taught by, being taught by the devil who wants to see your destruction? Who are you being taught by? Next parable. And this speaks to the heart. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite! 
First remove the plank from your own eye. Then you'll clearly see to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Wow, this speaks this speaks to the heart of how we humans like to operate. See, there's something funny that I have noticed about human beings. And I noticed it in myself first. And, and then I became sensitive to it in other people. The thing that we complain about other people the most is often the flaw that we carry within ourselves. Let me repeat that. The thing that ticks us off the most about other people is often the flaw that we carry within ourselves. Now, we may have repre rep bleh, suppressed and repressed that flaw. But it's still somewhere in us. And so when we see someone doing or saying the very things that we ourselves harbor in our heart, quite often it sets us off. And we want to fix them. The problem is, is how can we fix them? Because we can't even... Yes, we, we, we can see what's wrong with them, but it's all blurry because that same issue exists within us and within our own hearts. You might notice something about Balance Point. I don't spend a whole lot of time preaching about sin directly. And the reason being is, what well, one... The message of Balance Point is God's goodness. And I happen to believe that as we receive the seed of God's goodness and we begin to sow that seed of goodness back out, I personally happen to believe that just like we heard in our introduction, whatever we give out will come back to us. And again, that's why that's the scariest verse in the Bible. That, that, so why would I want to put out into the atmosphere a message of sin? Look, we all know that we sin. We all know that we miss the mark. Some of us more than others. I mean, there are days when I manage to miss the mark and my feet haven't even hit the floor yet. I don't need to be reminded that I'm a sinner. I get it. You don't need to be reminded that you're a sinner. You probably already get it. What you need to be reminded of is God's grace and God's mercy. Therefore, be merciful just as your Father is also merciful. Therefore, be kind, for He, your Father in heaven, is kind to the unthankful and the evil. God was kind to us before we were kind to him. God said the war is over before we even put down our arms against him. And so before we can help anybody else, we need help. We need to be helped. We need God's help. We need God's help to see our flaws. We need God's help to see where we miss the mark. We need God's help to see those things, those triggers that cause us to slip, stumble, and fall. Because then when we understand where we slip, stumble, and fall, and we begin to be able to navigate the potholes of life, the potholes of our emotions, the potholes of our relationships. As we navigate those, then we gain the wisdom to be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. And we gain that ability. And, and to be really honest, we will be so busy fixing ourselves, we don't have time to fix others. And all we'll be able to really do to help others is say, look, I got enough in my own bag. 
But if you hang out with me and you follow me as I follow Christ, follow Christ. Follow Christ. Then together we'll work out the stuff that's in our bags individually. And then we'll be able to help others. And that's why Jesus called them hypocrites because, again, they were complaining about something about their neighbor, their brother, that they themselves were struggling with. I find it interesting that some of the loudest voices condemning, and and by the way, I'm not saying that God approves of homosexuality. And in fact, let's not even use that one. Let's not even use that one. (laughs) Isn't it interesting that some of the voices that cry loudest about murder and murderers are also some of the most hateful people that tend to call themselves Christians? Did not Jesus say, You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit murder. But I say to you, if you are angry with your brother, you've already committed murder. You see, the thing that we complain about the loudest is the very thing that's inside of us. And we probably wouldn't even be complaining about it except for the fact that God begins to work on our hearts. And we begin to recognize, we begin to recognize that these are issues within our heart. So, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus and let him work on our heart. And then when we meet somebody that is displaying that thing that angers us, don't try to fix them. Just say, hey, let's follow Jesus together. Let's follow Jesus together. And now we have another subject jump. Verse 43. Hoo Oh, goody. Oh, yay. <sighs> I thought I was running out of time. There is a small chance we're going to finish this chapter today. Verse 43. Jesus gives us the way to tell where somebody is. Remember earlier, we're not, we're commanded not to judge. Verse 37, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. So we're not supposed to judge. But we are supposed to have discernment of a, of what is good and what is evil. Verse 43, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, and do not they do not gather grapes from a bramble bush. And Jesus explains his parable. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. So now the question. Here's here's another question for this week. What's coming out of your heart? The parallel to this was a question of eating food. Ritually clean food. And and in the parallel, Jesus explains, a man is not defiled by what goes into him. Because food simply goes in, passes through, and out. And by the way, that's pretty insightful because when you consider the fact that, you know, topographically, not topographically, topologically, topologically, the human body is actually, well, if, if you take a simplified version of the human body, we're basically an elongated donut. Think about that. 
we're an elongated donut. And so when Jesus says that what you eat just passes through and out, he's being topologically accurate. In other words, what you eat doesn't actually, I mean, the nutrients enter you, obviously. But that which your body does not need just passes through. We're not defiled by what we put in, but we are defiled by what comes out of us. And so I ask, what seeds have we planted in our heart? Going back up to that, to that very, very scary verse. To that very, very scary verse. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it will be given to you into your bosom. So I ask, what are you giving your heart? Because your heart is the soil of your life. And whatever you put into that soil, that is a crop that you are going to have to eat. That's a crop you're going to have to eat. What are you putting into your heart? What is growing there? What tree have you planted? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures in his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, what comes up, comes out. So the question is, what have you put down? And how, and, and not only what you put down, but I, I'm going to answer the, the question, how do you get good into your heart? How do you put good into your heart? Oh, well, going back to just a few minutes ago. I can tell you who you're going to be in 10 years by what you put in. The people you hang out with, the books you read, the stuff you watch on TV or on the internet. What are you putting in? What are you putting in? Because what you're putting in is going to grow, and once it grows, it's going to come out. And so with that in mind, Jesus brings us to verse 46. And he gives us a choice. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Why do you call him Lord? Why do you call him boss, boss, and you don't follow his orders? You're sitting in the church. Just because you're sitting in the church don't make you a Christ follower. Just because you call yourself a Christian don't make it so. I can call myself an airplane. And I can guarantee you if I jump off my roof, I ain't going to fly. Not going to happen. Why do you call me boss, boss? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show them who he is like. Well, first off, you're going to be like Jesus. You're going to be like the Father. But here's the example. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Interesting that it's not just on rock, on the rock. I wonder if that's a little play on words, kind of like uh, Jesus renaming Simon Peter. He named him Little Stone. But it is, it, it is like laying him, laying this foundation on the rock, on the rock. On the rock, wow. I want, I want to look at that rock just 
kind of briefly. I just want to, you know, look at Raw. Because there are many things you can build on. You can build on stone. You can build on a lot of stuff. But it is Petra. Petra. You build on the Petra. You build on the rock. Why? Because it anchors you. And then watch this. And when the flood arose, not if the flood arose, when the flood arose, there's a little truth here in this little phrase. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. I do know this much. As the bumper sticker says that I see when I made the drive to my office in Orange County, life happens. When life happens, what are you holding on to? And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it. For it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing I pray that you will do something with this word because it's going to get ugly. But when he heard and did nothing is like the man who built a house on the earth. Uh Oh, without a foundation. So you got a choice. You can build on the rock or you can build on the earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one yacht or one tittle will pass from the law. What's the one thing that's going to pass? Everything is going to pass away. So are you building on the rock? Are you building on the rock of the word? But he who heard and did nothing was like the man who built a house On the earth, without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. So the question that this whole chapter is asking is, what are you building and what are you building on? What are you planting So that what will you harvest? What are you putting in that will come back out? What are you giving away that will come back to you? That's the question. Who's your teacher? There are a lot of questions in this chapter. Who's your teacher and what are you learning? What have you planted? What are you growing? What are you building on? Are you building on the rock? Are you building on the stone that the builders have rejected, who is now the chief of the corner? In other words, Jesus. Are you building on the earth? Which, as Peter writes, will one day burn with fire. Another place it's been written that that this existence will roll up like a scroll. What are you building on? What are we building on? That's the question. And I pray that you are building on nothing less than Jesus. I pray that you are building on nothing less. I am reminded, I believe the title of the song is Sure Foundation. I'm just checking really quick.
Um, these are not actually the lyrics that I was looking for. Well, yes. No, the, the, I was looking actually for a different Sure Foundations lyric. But listen to the lyrics here. O oh Lord, we are your children, chosen and called by your name. With one heart and purpose we gather to glorify you and proclaim that you, Lord, are our sure foundation. We will not be afraid. When the storm comes, we will not be shaken. For by your hand, we are saved. Oh, by your hand, we are saved. What are you building on? What are you hoping in? Are you hoping in the things of the world? Or are you hoping on the things of God? Because if you're hoping on the things of the world, those the world shifts. The world shifts. The world changes. The world moves. The world flows. Heaven and earth will pass away. But not one yacht or one tittle of the world. But not one yacht, not one tittle will pass away. And the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. The word will not pass away. Jesus will not pass away. Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. He will not pass away. The father will never leave you and forsake you. He will not pass away. Why? Because when Jesus was on the cross, he was forsaken by the father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we would never be forsaken. When Jesus hung on the cross, he was rejected by man. And he accepted the sin so that we might reject sin and be accepted by God. So I ask you today, is Jesus your foundation stone? If he isn't, today's the day and you're the person. You'll make the choice, but God will make the change. Here's the deal. God's already made salvation a free gift for you and for me. He's already made salvation that gift. Already done. It's a done deal. But we have to choose to accept it. We have to choose to accept it. So, if you've never known Jesus or maybe you once walked with him, today you can ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And you can accept the Holy Spirit into your life because you have been cleansed of your sin by the shed blood of the Lamb of God. <clears throat> And all you got to do is ask. You just ask God. Here. In fact, if that's you, pray with me. Either these words or words to this effect from your heart. God, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I missed the mark. I failed. I was wrong about you, wrong about me, wrong about your son. I choose now to believe that you have sent your son, Jesus, to die on my behalf, to take the punishment that was mine. And I accept that forgiveness. I accept the washing of my sins away. And Father God, I invite the Holy Spirit to come and live within me. The very presence of the Godhead. Never to be separated from your life ever again. Thanks to Jesus. 
Thank you for doing this for me. And Father God, though there will be days when I will feel like I, it's not happened, I will trust. Now set my feet firmly in your presence. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. If you pray that, we would, be, we would love to pray with you and come into agreement with you. And you can do, you can contact us several ways. You can message us through our Facebook page at Bounce Point CC, our YouTube page at the Bounce Point Church. That's also our Gmail address, bouncepointchurch at gmail.com. You can email us at bounce-point.org, staff at bounce-point.org. We read every single message. We reread every single comment. And we're praying for each and every one of you. And we know that the, some of you we will never meet physically, but we will meet in heaven. And we thank God for each and every life that he has brought forth from this ministry. We invite you to come and visit our ministry center at www.balancepointla.org. All one word, Balance Point LA is in Balance Point Los Angeles. .org. We invite you to come visit us. We have some materials that are on the website. We have some tools to help you grow. And our back catalog of sermons is also available there in audio. And most of them are also linked with video, but definitely audio. And there, it is a free resource. Uh, we do ask that you, unless you are in a country where it is unsafe to reveal that you're a Christian, we do ask that you register. That way we can keep in contact with you. Uh, and so we invite you to visit our ministry center. We have a virtual sanctuary uh, that is available at uh, Balance Point Online. Balance Point, <laughs> it's a new address because it is actually a new platform. Balancepoint.online.church is our uh, virtual sanctuary. And uh, we stream there. And we're actually working on um, making the streaming there a little bit easier, a little bit simpler. But we do invite you to come and join us either via our Facebook page, via our uh, online ministry center, um, and, uh, you know, various locations. Oh, yay. That is so beautiful. <laughs> and so, we do invite you to join us there. If you need prayer, we are a praying church. We love to pray. And we live to pray. And uh, you, can, uh, you can get prayer by just emailing us at prayer at bound-point.org. And eventually all of these email addresses will be moving over to the new uh, to the new um, site. And of course you can contact us via the emails. And you can contact us. We will begin to do live worship again. Very, very soon we are almost situated where we can invite people in. So if you'd like information, you can contact us about that. And now, prepare to receive the blessing. May the God of heaven and earth richly bless you and keep you in the name of his Son. May the seeds that you receive today be planted into the soil of your heart. And may they grow strong, that you might have a harvest of good fruit, and that they might know you as a child of God. May your health 
and your prosperity be in alignment with the joy of the Lord and his presence. And most of all, may you carry with you this week an acute awareness of the presence of God into every place that you go, that they may know that you are loved and that you love. Amen and amen. Have a blessed week.